Attention all hands, it's time to croak some toads! Aye aye, Captain! <laughs> Them words is music to my pirate ears! Hey, remember when there were a bunch of 80s cartoons trying to be like Star Wars? Anybody remember Star Chaser, The Legend of Orin? Which is Star Wars with a crap load of chess references? Thousands of years ago, on some obscure planet, a primitive chess computer was the first inorganic mind to beat man. What? Do we need to do EYDK about Star Chaser? I'm down. Checkmate. Anyway, I think one of those Star Wars wannabes got closer than any other. Yes, we're gonna have to go right to ludicrous speed. <gasps> ludicrous speed? Sir, we've never gone that fast before. I don't know if the ship can take us. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken? Classic. But no. It was Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars, which was the animated version of Star Wars we never realized we needed as kids. I mean, you gotta love Bucky. He's magnificent. It's Bucky! Bucky O'Hare! And he's magnificent. This show is so Star Wars that they should have just called it Star Wars Episode 1.5. Oh, but don't take it from me though. The force is strong with Bucky O'Hare. He's magnificent. Now where the hell are my damn gloves? Damn, Juan Vader loves Bucky more than Mimi Laflu. Thank Bucky O'Hare, it was his idea. I will, in my own way. The best part was this was a Marvel co-production. Meaning it was Marvel's very own version of Star Wars before both franchises were bought by Disney 21 years later. And it captures everything that made Star Wars great. Like how they had their very own version of the Millennium Falcon with an equally great name. It's gonna take more than my ship the righteous indignation to stop them. Now you might be thinking my timelines are way off. How could a TV show that premiered in 1991 be a send up to a movie from 1977? We'll explain more in everything you didn't know about Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars. Bucky O'Hare and the Toad Wars premiered in 1991 and only ran for 13 episodes. It was short lived but left a lasting impression thanks in part to its incredible theme song, just like Star Wars. Bucky, Captain Bucky I love how they even find a way to seamlessly work in technical jargon like photon accelerator. And your photon accelerator Yo, this theme is crazy underrated. They even managed to introduce every main character, establish an intergalactic war between a united federation of animals and toads, and the concept of an alternate dimension called the Anniverse in just 25 seconds. The battle of the Anniverse, you don't know what's next, you only know amphibians are made it complex. Also, I've seen it theorized that it's called the Anniverse because it's a play on the fact that they're all animated. But it's because they're all animals, right? Let us know in the comments which one you think is right. I'll tell you what's not right though. Bucky's catchphrase. Let's croak us some toads! <laughs> My man's talking about murdering toads. Chill out, Buck. Veruca, uh, my darling, marry me. Alright, that was kind of creepy. Maybe the toads deserve it. Yes, one. Give in to your hatred of the toads. Only your anger will destroy them. Yo, relax, Juan Vader. Alright, enough, enough. So the concept of the show is that there is an Anniverse, which is a parallel universe filled with anthropomorphic animals who form a ragtag political organization called the United Animals Federation, sometimes referred to as the Coalition. Much like the Rebellion in Star Wars, it consists of a wide array of alien creatures and even the little dude from Men in Black. You'll never catch me! Though, that little dude was actually a spy for the Toad, so screw that guy. <laughs> like Star Wars, the villains even call them rebels. Guard these disgusting rebels while I take care of the rebel O'Hare. The planet Genus is where the United Animals Federation meets. It's also where Bucky loves to make awesome entrances. Bucky O'Hare is here! Everyone out there take note, that's how you barge into a meeting. Well eventually when we start having meetings again. It does present a challenge. Bucky flies a ship for space, which stands for Sentient Protoplasm Against Colonial Encroachment, which is a mouthful that almost makes this sound short. Tattooed teenage alien fighters from Burberry Hill. But I think the S in space should stand for solitary since they only have 
one ship. I asked for a fleet. You gave me one measly frigate. That's it? One frigate to fight the entire Toad Empire. These guys are enslaving entire civilizations and bragging about it right to camera. It isn't every day I conquer and enslave an entire planet, let alone the whole world of my greatest enemy, Bucky O'Hare! No shame. The Toad Empire was created by Complex. Do we now bear you fools? He's the big bad of this world who likes to appear on view screen or hologram to intimidate his underlings, like Palpatine. I don't want this stunted slime in my sight again. He was voiced by Long John Baldry, who has a sweet name, and also voiced Robotnik on the adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog. Super Robotnik! I'm finally going to get my revenge! Also, Complex can even use mystical powers, just like the Emperor, to brainwash his subjects, which is actually how he came to power in the first place. One day, the Toads discovered that Complex had taken over. It became their master, not their servant. And now the Empire wants to colonize and enslave the rest of the galaxy, mostly for the free massages. His top henchman is Toadboard. Next time, it will be your heads. Played by Richard Newman, the voice of M. Bison from the Street Fighter series. It is not like them to attack. Maybe Guile just snapped or something, impudent! Oh, heads up, we are doing an episode on the Street Fighter series, so stay tuned. Let's do it! Tolborg has some serious Vader vibes. For one, his body was destroyed and now he can only survive by living in a mechanical suit. He's also great at giving diabolical commands. Unleash the terror, Toad! Like when he has this ship just throw up all over a planet. More like a tractor beam, but not gonna split hairs. Get it? Hairs? Ah? No? <laughs> Fighting against Complex, Tolborg, and their henchmen are our heroes, led by Buckminster O'Hare himself. Yes, that's his full name. He's a lot like Luke. He's a true believer with extraordinary fighting skills who often looks before he leaves. Literally. <laughs> Bucky was played by Jason Micus, who played one of the battle toys. Well, you don't look so good yourself, buddy. Wait, so does that mean they're in the same cinematic universe? Anyway, Bucky's also pretty naive like Luke, like when he hires this clearly evil alligator named Al Negator. Al Negator, a warp drive mechanic. At your service, sir. His credentials look good, top rated. Mm, there's something about this Al Negator that makes my hair stand on end. I don't know, the innocent whistling may convince me too. Okay, Al, I'll give you a try. Then there's Jenny, Bucky's first mate who reminds me a lot of Leia. She's fierce, strong headed, and kicks a lot of ass. She's even from a planet that sounds like Alderaan called Alderbaran. And she takes matters into her own hands too, just like Leia. Like when she steals Bucky's ship to save her fellow cats, which she explains in a holographic message displayed by her loyal robot. I had to take the ship. I can't explain without betraying the sisterhood. Sound familiar? Come on, are you paying attention? Must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. Also, like Leia, Jenny has secret magic powers that allow her to communicate telepathically with the members of her sisterhood of magic users called the Artificers. Dire news. Felicia left on her soul quest without permission. See, what I love about Jenny is that she's by far the most powerful character, but she has to keep her power secret according to the bylaws of the, the Artificers. Though, it's mind blowing how much she's slept on by her own crew. No one ever notices her laser blasting giant intergalactic demons. Then there's the Han Solo of the group. Will he do it? So, you see, it's really the amplitude of various frequencies that makes. Nah, I'm just playing. Could I borrow your notes for the history test? I'd really appreciate it. Wait, did they just do the sexy pan up on an animated underage teenage girl? That's not cool. I think she likes me. Anyway, Willie's a whiz kid from Earth who accidentally stumbles into the Anniverse by a portal slash bedroom door. <laughs> Lightsaber! Lightsaber! Okay, that has to mean they're in the same universe, right? What do you all think? Is that enough for confirmation? He's saying lightsaber. Absolutely. Willie is more like Wesley Crusher. Oh, snap. Wrong reference. 
Don't hate me, Star Wars fans. Hate his parents, actually, who don't seem to care about Willy at all, being that he disappears for days on end and just leave him home with no supervision. Oh, David, the rally. We've got to run. I'm saying, if you're going to let the kid roam multiple dimensions, at least give him a curfew. Home by six. Or planet by six. The parental neglect is actually spot on for 80s and 90s cartoons. They don't care at all that he's hanging out in an intergalactic pirate bar. Willie, me boy, come and share a mug of old swamp grass with me. Bottoms up! Willie eventually becomes a ship's engineer after Bucky asks him to leave his friends, family, and life behind, which he agrees to with very little consideration. This is great, but I still have to see my parents and go to school and stuff. But you can stay for now, right? And help us out with our mission. Oh, sure. Han Solo is actually more like Dead Eye Duck, who's Daffy Duck's much more murderous alter ego. Give up the fight, you lots and his lizards, before I blast you into Tamara! Yeah, he's definitely got some dark side in him. Good. Let the hate flow through you, Dead Eye. Kill them all. What do you expect though? He's a former space pirate who's now fighting with the good guys. Like Han, he shoots first and asks questions later. What I know? What you doing, Bucky Lad? Let's finish him! Too dangerous to fire in here. We could blow up the photon accelerator. Hey! I love the hey from Bruiser. Very sloth from the Goonies. <laughs> also, like Han, Deadeye becomes one of the biggest advocates for the Rebels when he tries to convince his former crew of pirates, the Corsair Canards, to join the Federation. What's in it for us? It's about honor and pride. It's about the fact that you're doing the right thing and helping to save the universe. Now he just needs to convince his best friend, the unfortunately named Kamikaze Kamo, who they also just call Ninja Duck. Kamikaze Kamo, the ninja duck. He also has one of the most grating battle cries. Alright, that's going to be my new alarm. Then there's Bruiser, who's the Chewbacca of the crew. He's big, hairy, super strong, and has some rage issues. Why, you lousy toads? I'll, I'll murderize you! I'll... Bruiser, calm down. He's a Beetlejuicy and Berserker baboon, as the Storm Toad Troopers love to announce in unison. A Beetlejuicy and Berserker baboon! They live in tree huts like Wookiees, as seen here in the infamous Star Wars Holiday Special. I don't know what's going on in that whole entire show. The last member of the crew is AFC Blinky, which stands for Android First Class. He's both C-3PO and R2-D2 folded into one. He's sarcastic and fixes the ship like R2. Replaced microcircuits, but cannot predict unpredictable outcome of turning on accelerator. But he also gets knocked around a lot like 3PO. Oh, look at those banana peels. Is this any way to run a ship? Clean those up at once. That's about it for the main characters, but not for this show's connection to Star Wars. Remember when I said they're much more closely linked than you think? Gotta trust me on this. I do not find their lack of faith disturbing. It's completely justified, Juan. How does this show have anything to do with Star Wars? Aye, aye. So, Star Wars became a worldwide phenomenon in 1977, about 14 years before the Bucky O'Hare TV show premiered. But, Bucky O'Hare didn't start as a TV show. It was a comic first, and that was published in 1984, which gets us a lot closer. It gets even better when you learn that the property was developed a few years even earlier, in 1977, the same year that Star Wars came out. Boom, suck it, Vader! Now, according to an oral history of DC Comics, Bucky O'Hare, Miss Mystic, Sorcerer, and Star Slayer were each developed for DC in 1977, and 1978, but they all then remained in the hands of their creators, which according to creator Larry Hama is how Bucky O'Hare ended up with Continuity Comics and not DC. I was working at DC Comics and they said that we could create stuff and we'd own a big piece of it and they would publish it. So I worked this whole thing up, you know, and they said, well, you know, hand it in. And I said, well, where's my contract? And they never came up with the paperwork. I walked away with it and uh, Neil Adams, who was a really a big time comic book artist said he would publish it and I got a nice share of the rights. 
Hama is, of course, best known for writing the first G.I. Joe comics for Marvel, which became a huge hit even though he self-admittedly had no idea what he was doing. I never cared about plot. When I was writing 155 issues of the comic, I just made it up as I went, page by page, literally. I had no idea what the next story was going to be about. But it worked, and so did Neil Adams' idea to publish Bucky O'Hare in his own comic book line, Continuity Comics. Adams believed in the property so much that he later co-produced the series alongside EYDK veterans Sundial Productions, which also produced G.I. Joe. The animation was done by another EYDK alumnus, Acom Studios in South Korea, who also animated another sentient intergalactic animal. The original Bucky comics were later collected into a graphic novel and published in 1986 a reissued run in 1991, and were released again as a manga in 2008. And the show was a super accurate adaptation. Just look how similar the comic book characters are to their animated counterparts. But there are some differences from the comics. For one, in the comics, Willy is trapped in the Anniverse forever by his parents who accidentally turn off his photon accelerator. So it doesn't matter what version, bad parents. But in the show, he can travel interdimensionally whenever the crew needs help. Willie, really, we're under attack, and we've lost communications. Please come quickly, we need you. Uh, sure, you bet. Which brings up another important difference. In the cartoon, Willie discovers that Jenny has psychic powers and is the only crew member who knows her secret. Another difference is that the original engineer, the berserker baboon named Bruce, is killed off in the comics. But in the show, they sent him to Baboon Heaven. I landed in Baboon Heaven, brother. Now that I think about it, Sounds like they killed him. There are a few other small changes, like how there was an omnipotent mouse in the comics. He was kind of the comics Obi-Wan, but he wasn't in the show. Instead, Bucky gets his own Yoda-like character called the Mentor. Bucky O'Hare. Remember, it is easier to take a fortress from the inside by stealth than from outside by force. Bucky even has his own land speeder. So Star Wars. And there's so many more similarities, like how the names are all super cool and spacey. Like Commander Sirius Dogstar, commander of a ship called the Undefatable. And I shall perform my duty as an officer of the coalition. Kinda reminds me of General Pepper from Star Fox. Hmm? Star Fox, I want you to take out the enemy bio weapon. Here's another cool space name, Ramsey McCloud, who gets punked by the innocent whistler himself, Alnigator. Is the righteous indignation roundabouts here? Right this way, sir. So he was a bad guy. My, my. Some of the other Star Wars references are more linear, like how their own version of Stormtroopers are called Stormtoads. Also, like Stormtroopers, the Stormtoads provide a lot of comedic relief, like the Air Marshal and the totally inept Fricks and Fracks. Return to the home world at once. <sighs> Do you think Complex will melt his metals? I think Complex will melt him. Also, the themes are very similar. Both properties are about an over-reliance on technology, colonialism, and even environmentalism, which is an important component of the force that we often overlook. The entire surface of the Toad homeworld is now factory seven layers deep, churning out endless numbers of Toad ships of war and weapons for one purpose. Total toad domination of the universe. I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. Star Wars also appeals directly to children while introducing adult concepts, and this show is no different. Like torture, for example. <laughs> and half naked girls. The crowning of this year's Miss Toad TV! Also, the Toad Empire's home planet looks like the Death Star. Actually, so do their satellites. The Righteous Indignation also has some stylistic similarities to the Millennium Falcon. Just peep how the turret has a near identical design as the Falcon. And this scene is so similar to this shot from Star Wars. I feel like this battle between Toadborg and Bucky is a lot like the fight between Vader and Luke in Empire Strikes Back. And this is the battle on Hoth, right? See? It truly is the animated spiritual successor to Star Wars. 
it's just a shame that it didn't find a fraction of its success. That's outrageous! Also because the toys were incredible. Look, I still got a couple. Larry Hama specifically designed the characters as toys first so that they resemble the animated characters to a T. New Bucky O'Hare action figures sold separately. So it kind of sucks that the toys are what got the show canceled. No! No! According to Larry Hama, low sales were due to a shipping and distribution error upon release, where there were an equal amount of good guy toys, you know, Bucky, Willie, etc., as bad guy toys. So, all the good guy toys sold out. But what was left on the shelves was a bunch of Toad Air Marshals and Toad Troopers. Had there been twice as many Bucky's, Dead Eyes, Jennies, maybe sales would have been better. At least the showrunners, though, knew the series was ending and gave Bucky and his crew a shout out at the end. We owe it all to the brave members of SPACE and Captain Bucky O'Hare, the heroes of one. I just wish it was as wildly popular as Star Wars. Then we'd have a Bucky O'Hare cinematic universe, too. Be careful not to choke on your Bucky O'Hare aspirations, boy. We should enjoy what we have. They are comics, a web series, an arcade game, even an NES video game. Throw to the clip of the game. Now hold up. You don't get to tell me what to do. After all, you killed my father. No one. I am your father. I always wanted to say that. What was your favorite Star Wars reference in Bucky O'Hare? Let us know in the comments. Oh, and next time on EYDK, to give you a hint, it's October and we're hitting up a certain Nickelodeon show. Huh? Think about it. Still can't believe I couldn't find my gloves. That Bucky O'Hare, he done went to town. That evil old complex, he shut right down. <laughs> All right! Thanks for watching! For more EYDK, click on Deadeye, and for new episodes that drop every other week, subscribe and click on Bucky.